from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Today on Ag Day, see what farmers in Louisiana are doing to get ready for another crawfish season. We're gonna lose it, you know, if we don't figure out how to get rid of this thing. The fight to get some very pesky bugs as concerns grow over the possibility of an early frost. That's really pushing our luck on avoiding a killing freeze. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado and the all new Silverado HD, the strongest, most advanced family of Silverados ever. Good morning, I'm Clint Griffiths. Some of you may be waking up to snow, while others may be in areas dealing with near freezing temperatures right now. And as Ag Day's Betsy Chippen reports, given the maturity of the crop, that's a big concern for many farmers. The worries of late planting now catching up to farmers this week as they see if the freezing temps and snow from the upper Great Plains moves east. The maturity of the U.S. corn crop is running at its slowest pace since 2009. And soybeans dropping leaves, it's the slowest since 1996. We do expect season ending freezes in Montana, the western Dakotas, perhaps along the Canadian border in North Dakota, but generally just scattered frost across the upper Midwest. But there's still a question how far south and east the cold could go. Some of the shorter range models are now picking it up for this week, so we're probably going to have at least the northern plains get a frost. There are signs that that trough's going to try to come eastward, but not come all the way east. We do expect at this time to see some frost, possibly as far south as southern Wisconsin and northern Iowa, but not likely to be a season ending freeze. Some of these states may suffer the most if an early frost arrives with less of a quarter of the state's soybeans dropping leaves in Missouri, Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin. And only 8% of the corn is mature in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota, down double digits from the five-year average. Roughly three-fourths of the crop has dented. Frankly, any crop that's at dough stage today may not mature until the last week of October or the first week of November. That's really pushing our luck on avoiding a killing freeze when we get out to that point in the calendar. A financial worry for a frost farmers just can't have right now. Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Betsy Gibbon. For more on this cold snap, we go to Ag Day meteorologist Cindy Clausen. Cindy, portions of Montana were expecting up to three feet of snow over the weekend, and now that cold weather is on the move. Yeah, unfortunately, we're really looking at a chilly few days, especially for the north central United States. And look at what the jet stream really tells a story. You can see the kind of very cool and stormy conditions in the northwest, very warm conditions in the southeast. Everything kind of shifts off to the east a little bit as far as the northern states. And that cold air moves to the west. It's not quite as intense as what we're seeing over in Montana, but northern parts of the Corn Belt could be seeing some very close to freezing temperatures as we get into Friday. Things kind of flatten out a little bit, but we will start to see another uh, trough starting to dig in later on next weekend after we have a brief respite from the heat. But take a look at some of the temperature trends. The real cold air over Montana as we get into Tuesday, you see some of that starting to move to the east into the Dakotas by the time we get to Thursday. Not super cold there, but we are looking at the potential for some lows getting down into the low to mid 30s, not only in parts of western Minnesota, most of north Dakota and even especially the central and western part of South Dakota as well. So certainly something that we're really going to have to keep our eyes on. Clinton. All right, thanks, Cindy. Be looking for this in the mail next month. The USDA is giving many farmers an extra prevent plant payment. It says producers with federal crop insurance who have a payable prevented plant indemnity from flooding or excess moisture will automatically get it. It's called a top up payment and producers should start seeing them toward the middle of next month. Those with harvest price exclusion will get a 10% payment. Other producers with revenue protection will get 15%. China is continuing to buy U.S. soybeans. USDA announcing another flash sale on Friday of 126,000 metric tons. That brought the end of week total of Chinese bean buys to 964,000 metric tons. As for trade talks between the U.S. and China, China's foreign ministry said both nations had recently shown goodwill and he hoped the momentum would continue. Top level talks are now planned to start October 10th. That's when Chinese Vice Premier Liu He will meet U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin in Washington. 
California is opening a new front in the battle against Wang Long Bing or citrus greening. It's caused by tiny insects no bigger than the grain of rice. California citrus growers and packers, along with the University of California Riverside, opened the $8 million lab. It will allow for research on the disease in a secure environment. Growers say they hope the biosafety level three lab will speed up the search for a cure. For now, they are protecting crops by covering fruit during transit to prevent insects from carrying the tree killing bacteria through the state. Another pest scientists are working to get rid of right now. Lantern flies. The insects threaten $18 billion worth of Pennsylvania agriculture. That includes tree fruit, timber, hops, and especially grapes. The bugs weaken trees and vines by sucking the sap from them. Now researchers are studying ways to eradicate it. You know, a lot of the vineyards that didn't do a lot of spraying in the beginning are totally gone. Uh, it's decimated every single vine in those vineyards. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fighting that by spraying, but I realize that the, that that is the potential that could happen here is we could lose everything. We have these little micro vineyards that, you know, we can spend a lot of time and, and we put a lot of quality into our, what we're doing and we're going to lose it, you know, if we don't figure out how to get rid of this thing. And the lantern fly is expanding its range. Infestations have been confirmed in New Jersey, Delaware, and Virginia. Still ahead, important numbers that could move markets this week when it comes to pigs. And later, we get ready for crawfish season as farmers prep their fields ahead in the country. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on machinerypeat.com. It once had ambitions of dominating the world's dairy markets, but instead it's suffering stinging losses and has been forced to scale back its vision. Fonterra of New Zealand announcing its worst ever annual earnings. The company's announced an after-tax loss of $380 million for the year, which ended in July. It's now promising to stay more focused on its roots on New Zealand dairy farms. Owned cooperatively by 10,000 farmers, the company is the most important to New Zealand's economy. It's responsible for some 25% of New Zealand's exports. The quarterly hogs and pigs report is out from USDA and it's breaking all kinds of records. It reports the U.S. hog inventory up 3%. That's the highest September 1st inventory of all hogs and pigs since the estimates started back in 1988. Inventory now standing at 77.7 .7 million head. Breeding inventory at more than 6 million head. That's up 2% from last year and slightly above last quarter. Marketing's inventory is now pegged at 71 million head, up 4% from last year. And it's another record breaker, the highest market inventory since those estimates began. And if you look at just the June to August pig crop, it stands at more than 35 million head, up 3% from last year. Again, the largest June to August pig crop on record. The average pig saved per litter, also a record high, 11.11 .11 for the period, compared to over 10 last year. Bob Utterback, Utterback Marketing, our guest here in studio today. Bob, let's talk about the hog market because we know that this African swine fever continues to spread. Uh, South Korea, Russia, we've got new reports it seems every week. What does that mean for our hog market here at home? Because right now we've got big supplies. We got big supplies. The media, as we saw South Korea this week, basically, it's a 48 hour in total shutdown of the system. And that's forced some product into our market you know, usage wise. It's helped us short term. Eventually, when that price activity and you know, when that, that disease, if it hits the United States, I don't think it's if, I think it's when mm. it occurs, you'll see immediate bearish reaction. So I think a defensive posture has to be for producers. When you look at, I'm more out into next summer prices. I've got guys looking at next June, July, we're in the low 90s. You get in that 92 to 96 level, you gotta start thinking about how can I lay off risk and still mean upside potential. And to me, that is not a short cash sale where you, you're all done. Well, you can do that for party room inventory, but I like the more the put strategy where you buy a put, sell a put, do a straddle. You're basically putting a floor of twenty to thirty dollars in your on your underneath yourself. But if the market rallies, you can participate in a rally in the cash market. So you're not going all in. You're not you're not going to have a major margin call exposure if the market rallies to say one hundred, one or two, one or four. 
but you have a floor if you have a, an event and it goes down to the low 60s. Hmm. And so that to me is, I think, a prudent management, risk management. I'd be getting my feed needs locked up hmm. this fall. Not that I'm bullish because the prices are low. You know, if you get down to that 60, 360 level, I'd be probably through Dick Spring, but I wouldn't go past probably July in my feed needs. And I would next fall would really be one to protect long-term feed needs when we get to a lot lower levels in the corn market. Many thought the rise of African swine fever in China would mean a rise in China buying pork from the U.S., but so far, that really hasn't been the case, at least on a bigger scale. Farm Journal's Time Morgan has this analysis from the road. Here now with Jason Lusk of Purdue University, looking into African swine fever. I mean, we've been talking about it. We see how it's impacted uh, areas and, and hog producing areas in Asia, yet we're not seeing this slew of pork go to China, mm -hmm. export to China like we thought we would. Why do you think that is? Well, the trade issues, unfortunately. So China exports of U.S. hogs and pork to China has increased but not as much as it could have had we not had these really high t uh, tariffs on Chinese pork. So there was a real opportunity out there, unfortunately for China, for China but it was an opportunity for us that in a way was kind of squandered because we have these high tariffs in place. Yeah, so when you look at the opportunities ahead, if we can keep ASF out of our commercial hog herd, mm -hmm. and China's really forced to come to us for some of their demand, realistically, how much opportunity is there right now? I mean, the, the numbers are incredible. I think some people don't really uh, understand the magnitude of, of the hog supply in China. So the amount of hogs they've lost to this are, you know, probably double the size of the U.S. hog sector. So it's a, it's a big deal. And the question is, will the Chinese be willing to substitute towards poultry or beef? Uh, that may be something that is a little more difficult to reverse. Yeah, so do you think that they do resort to other proteins? I think they're going to in the short run just because they don't really have many other options. And you've seen even government efforts there to try to promote, push people towards poultry and some other proteins. But even if we see the tariffs? reduced a little bit? Do you think then we do have some opportunity and can it last? Yeah, I think there's there's some hopeful opportunity there and, um, and you know, the about 22% of pork is exported last year and so really the, the having access to consumers in other parts of the world is a big deal for us and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. All right, Jason, thank you so much for Thanks joining time. us. We appreciate it. Let's take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on Ag Day. Hey y'all, Justin Moore here. Get ready to kick up some dust with the Rock Sword Dirt Roads and a Country Show Sweepstakes. Enter now for a chance to win a customized off-road Rock Sword and two VIP tickets to one of my upcoming concerts. Visit rocksoaroffroad.com forward slash Justin Moore. Sydney Clawson taking a look at uh, rainfall over the past week or so, and there were quite a few areas that got significant amounts of rain. Oh, absolutely, and you can see here, especially in the nation's midsection, let's take a look. The main focus that we see over here in parts of Texas, Oklahoma, straight on up the Mississippi. And you can see we also had a lot in northwestern Minnesota and North Dakota as well. And you zoom into those areas, you can see a lot of spots. We're seeing over three inches of rain. That's where you see the orange color, four or five inches of rain in some spots as well. So very heavy rainfall in parts of the central plains and into the Missouri River Valley. You can see uh, over towards Peoria had a lot of rain there, potentially over three inches and then as you get uh, even up into the northern plains. Now as far as our outlook for this week, we are looking at above normal precipitation through the Great Lakes, upper Midwest and most of the plain states, even into the Four Quarters region, a little bit into the Pacific Northwest as well. Perhaps a bit on the dry side in the southeast. That's not good because you really could use the rain there. Now as we take a look at temperatures over the next week, we are looking at some really warm weather in the southeastern United States, above normal temperatures into the southern plains but the cold is what we're really, really focusing on in the northern parts of the United States, much below normal temperatures for most of Montana, Wyoming, even to the western part of the Dakotas, and below normal continues even into the upper Midwest and parts of the Great Lakes area. Looks like it's going to be a little on the cool side as well as even you get down into southern California. Now, as we widen out our view, take a look a little bit into the future as far as temperatures for the next 30 days. Yeah, we'll still be cool in some of those areas areas in the northern Rockies, the northern high plains still looking cool, but not quite as widespread. It's just going to be particularly cool as we get into this week above normal temperatures for pretty much the entire eastern half of the country. And as you get down into the south and southwest as well, 
precipitation over the next 30 days on the dry side in the northeastern United States, but it looks like we're going to see some wet weather in much of the central and western parts of the Corn Belt all the way through the Plain States and into the Four Corners region as well. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. Bozeman, Montana scattered snow showers for you today with a high of 39 degrees. Seminole, Oklahoma, mostly sunny with a high of 87 and Hamilton, Alabama, sunny and hot, a high of 94 degrees. So ahead, learning what goes into making crawfish season happen. Plus machinery Pete takes on used tillage equipment. Tillage has been one of the hottest sectors on the used market folks. Now stick around and I'll tell you about an auction in Northwest Minnesota last week that proved it. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. One thing is getting a lot of clicks on Machinery Pete's site. He's here to talk tillage. One of the hottest sectors of the used market here recently, folks? Well, that would be tillage. In fact, the last 30 days, we've seen a 13.6% increase in search traffic to use tillage items for sale at our machinerypeat.com website. And if we back that up and compare to 60 days ago, well, now we've seen a 39.8% jump in search traffic. Now, it's very telling to know that more people are looking for a certain thing. But you know me, uh, for 30 years now, I still rely on the checkbook reality of the auction market. Put something up for sale, see what it brings. Now, we got proof of the strong demand for good use tillage last Tuesday on a farm auction up in northwest Minnesota we filmed for our Machinery Pete TV show. And on the auction was this very sharp 2014 John Deere 2210 field cultivator, 55 and a half foot with a four bar John Deere harrow, and the thing had under 3,500 acres total use. Now, it sold for 58,000 bucks, which is the highest auction price this year on a 2210 field cultivator. And in fact, it's only $2,500 off the highest price I've seen it auction the past 34 months. Now right next to it on the auction was this real sharp 2011 John Deere 2410 chisel plow. This thing was 33 foot and sold for $27,500. Now just in the last two months alone, I've seen four 2410 chisels sold at auction from Minnesota out to Idaho in this low 30 foot range sold from $26,000 to $31,000. You can almost smell them boiling as Louisiana gets ready for crawfish season. See how they do it next. Hey y'all, Justin Moore here. Get ready to kick up some dust with the Rock Sword Dirt Roads and a Country Show Sweepstakes. Enter now for a chance to win a customized off-road Rock Sword and two VIP tickets to one of my upcoming concerts. Visit rocksoaroffroad.com forward slash Justin Moore. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. While well, crawfish season is still a ways off, farmers are now getting their fields ready. As Craig Gotro reports, when the weather cools, farmers will begin to flood their fields, encouraging crawfish to emerge from their burrows. In a few weeks, farmers will begin flooding these former rice fields and transform them into next season's crawfish ponds. Getting a field ready for crawfish starts early, in the spring, when choosing the variety of rice to grow in it. We grow varieties in the crawfish ponds that are uh, going to be maybe a little taller, a little leafier, uh, bigger stems, um, you know, whatever it takes to get as much food out in that field as possible. Richard likes to recycle water from ponds located nearby. According to him, it makes sense both economically and environmentally. We're not drawing down off the aquifers. Uh, it's cheap water because you're not relifting it real high. Doesn't cost us a whole lot of diesel or electricity, uh, whatever, the, whatever the fuel source is. While some farmers may be getting eager to flood their fields, conditions are not favorable, so they should hold off flooding until the weather cools. If you flood this field, it's gonna be some really bad habitat for crawfish. There's just too much uh, dead organic matter on the ground. That's gonna rot, decompose, and you have uh, really low oxygen. Monsoon-type rains are typical in South Louisiana, especially during hurricane season. But while this may be free water, farmers should remove it quickly to keep crawfish from emerging in poor conditions. It may be best just to hold a little shallow flood, just a, a few inches, just to wet the vegetation, but do not hold a real deep flood. Uh, let all that excess water get out. Last year's season was below average. This year conditions have been more favorable, and farmers are optimistic about having a better harvest. 
With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gocho reporting. Now, some farmers will begin harvesting their ponds as early as November to take advantage of higher prices for their catch. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. Spent part of your day with us from all of us here at Ag Day, including Griffiths. Have a great one. Ag Day, brought to you by the Milk Business Conference. Don't miss this dairy business-focused event November 11th and 12th, 2019 in Las Vegas. Register today at milkbusinessconference.com.